Hello, I'm Chuck Long, Iowa Sports Foundation CEO and Executive Director. Welcome to the 2021 Summer Iowa Games presented by Grinnell Mutual. We're excited to bring you our opening ceremony virtually this year, thanks to 3M. We wish we could be together in person, but we're glad you are here watching with us tonight. We have an exciting evening planned, beginning with our national anthem performed by Iowa's own Dr. Simon Estes. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave Thank you, Simon. That was wonderful. The Iowa Games wouldn't be possible without the continued support of Iowa State University and the community of Ames. Here's a brief message from Ames Mayor John Hala. Good evening, I'm Ames Mayor John Hala, and on behalf of all Ames citizens, welcome to the 35th annual Iowa Games. The Iowa Games began in August of 1987 and were held here in Ames. They started as weekend event featuring 16 sports and around 7,100 participants. For the first time in our state's history, weekend athletes, school-aged children, senior citizens could experience the thrill of great performances and the satisfaction of doing their best in a statewide Olympic-style competition. The Iowa Games has become an integral part of the Ames Summer Experience. We are proud to have been a part of this event since its inception. I'd like to thank the athletes, families and coaches who return to Ames each year to participate in the Iowa Games. And if this is your first time participating, we're pleased you're here to compete and to be our guests. I wish each one of you success in all of your events. Thank you, Mayor Hala. This past year has been difficult as our world has been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and the many changes it brought. Our lives were also changed when we lost a great friend, father and grandfather, Jim Hallahan. In addition to his many roles, Jim served as the Iowa Games Executive Director for nearly 20 years. He played an integral part in growing the Iowa Games and the Iowa Sports Foundation into what it is today. Let's pause for a moment of silence as we remember this great man, mentor, and leader. Jim, you will be dearly missed. Now let's welcome former Iowa Games athlete, UNI professor, and one of the first Iowans to climb the north side of Mount Everest, Andy Anderson. Hi, my name is Andy Anderson. I'm an adventurer, entrepreneur, and academic. I'm from Boone, Iowa, and I'm now a tenure professor at the University of Northern Iowa's College of Business. Back when I was in, in uh, grade school, I uh, participated in the, in the Iowa Games in several different uh, sports and I just loved my time there. And we were quite successful sometimes and, and had uh, adversity at other times, um, but I learned a lot of great lessons through those years. Back in high school, I also started rock climbing. I started rock climbing with one of my best friends in high school um, almost every day after school. When I went to college, I started to climb uh, higher uh, mountains out in Colorado um, and just had a, had a great time climbing mountains and uh, fell in love with them, really. Um, after I graduated from UNI, I lived abroad for about seven or eight years, mainly in China and in England, 
And in 2012, I came back to Iowa and I taught at Drake University's MBA program. Um, the next year, a job came open at UNI, and so I took that, and, and now I'm, uh, I've, been, I've been there ever since. So when I came back to the US, I really jump-started my mountain climbing activities. And I started to climb progressively more difficult, harder, and higher mountains. Um, and so I started out back in college climbing Devil's Tower out in Wyoming with some of my college, uh, college friends. Um, which is a really big, cool thing out in Wyoming. Um, and then my cousin and I climbed uh, uh, the Grand Teton. I've climbed most of the, uh, the 14ers out in Colorado, which is any mountain higher than 14,000 feet. Um, and then uh, in 2013, my cousin, my wife, and I went to Kilimanjaro, which is half the, uh, the highest mountain in Africa, to climb it. And the really cool part about that story is that my wife climbed it while she was four months pregnant. So she made it to the top. We all made it to the top, had a great time, um, came back down, and man, I just loved that international, those big mountains. Um, so my cousin and I um, went up to Denali in Alaska. And we climbed uh, um, that mountain. And it went really smoothly for the most part, except on summit day, I tied my boots a little bit too tight. And uh, I felt fine the whole day, but it's so cold up there, you don't really notice things. I got back down to our tent after summiting, and it turned out my, the, the big toe on my right foot had severe frostbite. So I went to see a frostbite expert down in Anchorage, and he said, oh, yep, it's going to turn black, and the tip is going to fall off. And it turned black, and the tip fell off. Uh, but amazingly, it grew back. And so uh, the doctor said, oh, that's not normal, but uh, now it's structurally all messed up. So take care of your toe moving forward, um, but uh, you should be fine. So I do have all, all uh, 10 uh, toes still. Um, and then I've also climbed all over the world. So I've climbed in uh, Switzerland um, and uh, the Matterhorn, uh, which is a really, really neat mountain out there. I've been to Russia to climb Mount Elbrus, uh, which is in the southern part of Russia and the highest mountain in Europe. Um, and on May 22nd, 2017, my cousin and I became the first Iowans to scale the north side of, of Mount Everest. So. The reason I, I, I gave you the background for the other mountains that we climbed leading up to Mount Everest is that su success takes an iterative approach. You don't just go from nothing to the highest mountain in the world. You have to work your way up there, climbing progressively more difficult, higher mountains, pushing your limits little by little, not taking any big leaps. And that's the secret to success. So the first time I saw Mount Everest, I was both scared and excited. I was scared because I had never seen a mountain that big before in my life. And I thought to myself, what have I gotten myself into? This is huge. How in the world am I going to get up there? But I was excited because I knew that I had trained hard, both mentally, physically, and technically, and I was in a good position to be successful. Um, and I knew that my cousin and I had trained well enough that we were up for the challenge of that two-month expedition. It takes, you heard that right, it takes almost two months to climb Mount Everest. So the sequence of events is, you when you're going from the north side, the China side, you fly into China, you have to wait for your Tibetan visa, you get the Tibetan visa, you fly to Lhasa, which is the capital of Tibet, and then Lhasa's already over, just the airport is already over 11,000 feet high. So you go there, you rest for a few days, get acclimated, and then you go up to a new, uh, another city, um, uh, a couple thousand feet uh, higher, you rest there for a couple days, and then you go up a little bit uh, to the next city, which was New Tengri. Um, you rest there for a couple days, and then you make it up to base camp. Base camp is at 17,000 feet. That's higher than any mountain in the continental US. Really, really high. And when I got to base camp, I was so excited. I'm like, all right, this is my dream. I've been working so hard uh, to finally be here. So I'm like, okay, feel good. I got out and I went for a run. I ran about a half mile up the mountain and a half mile back down. And I thought to myself, wow, that was probably not the right thing to do. And sure enough, about an hour later, I'm puking my brains out. Um, my stomach has, is distressed and I just feel miserable. My head's pounding. And this lasts for two days. I had, mount, I had altitude sickness. I know better than that. I've climbed other mountains, and I still made the mistake of going up, going too hard. 
not letting myself acclimate properly. So the acclimatization process is when your body, uh, in areas that have less oxygen, your body will produce more red blood cells uh, to compensate for that. The red blood cells are the ones that move through your body and distribute the oxygen. So if you have less oxygen, you need more red blood cells to distribute the same amount of oxygen throughout your body. And as you go higher, your body will naturally produce more red blood cells. And I skipped a step. I, I tried to go too fast. So um, I was sick as a dog for a couple days. The, the, the people we hired to do our uh, cooking and stuff like that at base camp, they said, hey, if you're not better within the, by tomorrow, we're going to send you down. And luckily, by the next day, I was feeling good again. Um, so the sequence of events, you're at base camp for a few days, and then you go up to intermediate camp. You go back down to base camp. You just touch it. You go back down to base camp. Rest for a couple days. You go back up to intermediate camp. You sleep there. Back down to base camp. Sleep there for a couple days. Then go to intermediate camp. Sleep there. Push up to advanced base camp, which is at 20,000 feet. That's higher than Denali, right? So we were at the advanced base camp and they're already higher than the highest mountain in North America, which is really high. Um, so you rest there for a couple days, and then you go up to, to uh, Camp 1, and just touch it, go back to Advanced Base Camp, go back up to Camp, uh, camp 1, you, rest, uh, you sleep there, you push up toward Camp 2 for a few hours the next morning, back down to Advanced Base Camp, back down to Base Camp, and you rest there for around a week in the relatively thick air of 17,000 feet, so your body can rejuvenate a little bit. Because um, when you're up that high, your body's just constantly deteriorating. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not a fun place to be. Um, and so uh, then uh, you wait for the right weather window at that point. You're waiting down at base camp. When the weather looks to be right, you're going to have that wind, that sweet spot for the window when you can really go for it. Then you go from base camp to advanced base camp. You usually wait for a day. And then advanced base camp to camp one, camp, uh, camp one to camp two. And then from camp two, you go to Camp 3, and then that same night, you push from Camp 3 to the summit, and then back down to Advanced Base Camp and back down. Well, when I was going from uh, Camp 2 to Camp 3, about five minutes below, we were almost at Camp 3, and I saw my first dead body. And I got all excited. I'm like, oh, I knew there were so many dead bodies on Everest. Uh, so I got out my camera, I was snapping pictures, and then I got close to the dead body and I saw that they, he was wearing this year's boots, this year model of boots. He was, the, his backpack was this year's model. And I thought to myself, this body hasn't been up here 60 years. This is a fresh one. And so as I came up closer, I, I came upon, we were the first group to come across, across this dead body. I later learned that this guy's name is Frank. He's from Australia. And uh, I talked to some Sherpas that were in camp, and they said, oh, yeah, you know, he's climbing Everest the exact same way that you are. He's using oxygen. He had Sherpa support on the, on, the, uh, on the final push. He's doing everything the same that you're doing. And that shook me. I thought to myself, what am I doing up here? I have two small children. Is this really worth the risk? Frank was going down. His brain swelled up. He fell over. He's dead. That's final, right? What am I doing up here? So when I got to camp three, I was laying in my tent. You have about six or seven hours. You're just laying there doing nothing. And all I could think about was Frank and whether or not I should be, in Ever uh, be on Everest at all. And that was, that was really, really the wrong thing to do because you need to be concentrating on your task ahead, right? So you need to be drinking a little bit. And every drink that you take is very difficult to keep it down. Every bite of food is a struggle. You're so nauseous. You have to be focused on the task ahead. And I wasn't doing any of that because I was preoccupied with Frank and the possibility of death. Finally, I got over it and I said, you've worked hard. You have had no problems coming into this. Uh, you've had no problems on the mountain. You can do this. And once I made that mental move to know that I could accomplish this goal, I switched my mind. I took care of business in the tent. We left uh, for the summit at 10 p.m. that night. And we made it to the summit the next morning at 4 a.m. We were at the summit for, uh, we planned to get there after the sunrise, but uh, we got there, we were moving so well that we got there early. We got there about 45 minutes before the sunrise. So while everybody else around us was trying to take pictures and, and all that sort of stuff, my cousin and I just looked at each other and we put our cameras away and we decided rather than trying to capture the moment, we would be in the moment just for a little bit on the top of the world. 
After that, we went back down and, uh, um, and it was all good. So the top three feelings that I had when I was climbing Everest, first was pain. I was just in a lot of pain. It was, my head was pounding every day like a migraine. Um, you're nauseous every single day. It's just a, physically a miserable, miserable two months. The second emotion was boredom, right? You have all, you're up there all this time and you can't really do much. You're just sitting there bored, reading a book maybe, but it's hard to read a book when you have such a bad headache. So you're just bored most of the time. Um, and then the third, distant third feeling was joy. Joyfully climbing up the mountain. But that was a distant third. Climbing Mount Everest is not pleasurable. It's a, it's a very, very difficult and painful experience. So some of the, the main lessons that I took away from this experience. First are link leverage and learn, right? So when I was just starting to climb mountains, I linked with some other people who had a lot of experience climbing mountains. And I learned from them. I, I was a, an okay runner at that point, and so I could leverage some of my physical ability um, to, to try and keep up with them. And I learned a lot from those people. So linking with people who are better than you to make yourself better is, is, is important. Another lesson I learned is to do hard things, you have to do easy things first. If you're not able to do the easy things well, the hard things aren't going to be, they're not going to happen. So make sure you're able to do the easy things uh, well. Don't shoot for the record your first time going out and, and trying something new, okay? Um, rather, do one exciting thing, and then when you're successful at that, do the next more exciting thing, and then when you're successful at that, you keep pushing forward. Um, the next lesson I learned was practice the fundamentals to the point of memorization. And what I mean by that is the things that you have to do over and over and over, whether it's a sport or uh, academics or on the mountain, do those things over and over and over. So when the time comes, when you're in a pinch and you have to do something, that it happens automatically. For me, that was knowing the, ro the, uh, the different knots on the ropes and knowing uh, how to use my crampons and ice axe and all those sort of things were second nature, didn't even need to think about it. And that clears the, your brain to process more complex tasks without your body even knowing it. So you're actually able to do much more complex activities by doing the fundamentals, having those become muscle memory. My last piece of advice is to remember that each peak is not a summit. So when you work hard and you have victories at the Iowa games, remember that those might be peaks and not summits. Keep working hard and all those peaks come together and it will come to something that you'll never dream of. So best of luck to all of you at the Iowa Games and all of your peaks, your valleys, and your eventual summits. Wow, Andy, that is simply amazing. Thank you for the inspiring message to our athletes. Speaking of former Iowa Games athletes, did you know the State Games of America is coming to Ames and Des Moines next summer? Here is former Iowa Games athlete and Paralympic silver medalist, Matt Stutzman, to tell you more. Hi, my name is Matt Stutzman. I was once an Iowa Games athlete, and now I'm a Paralympic silver medalist and world record holder. I'm inviting you to join me next summer at the 2022 State Games of America right here in our home state. Did you know that all Iowans qualify for this event? Let's show all of the out-of-state athletes what Iowa is all about. I will be aiming for gold at the Paralympics in Tokyo, and I hope you will aim for gold at the 2022 State Games of America. Good luck this year at the 2021 Summer Iowa Games, and I can't wait to see you guys next summer. Thank you, Matt, and good luck as you go for the gold in Tokyo. Sportsmanship has always been a big part of the Iowa Games, from the athletes, coaches, and parents. Now we will hear from Iowa State head football coach, Matt Campbell, as we all recite the oath of athletes and parents. I promise that I shall take part in these Iowa games, respecting and abiding by the rules which govern them, in the true spirit of sportsmanship. I will encourage good sportsmanship by demonstrating positive support for all players, coaches, and officials at the Iowa games. I will do my best to make youth sports fun for all children. Thank you, Coach Campbell. 
As we near the end of our Iowa Games virtual opening ceremony sponsored by 3M, I would like to thank you for watching, congratulate all the athletes who have already medaled in Iowa Games events, and wish good luck to all athletes this weekend. Now, in the spirit of the Iowa Games tradition, there's only one thing left to say. Let the games begin.